Hi there, I'm Josh, and welcome to our Church on the Move online service. We're so excited you decided to join us, but before we get started, I want to tell you a few ways you can get involved wherever you're watching from. Now you can be a part of the Church on the Move family. If you haven't already, we'd love to connect with you online by having you like our Facebook page or subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can find out everything that's happening at Church on the Move and stay connected to all our different events and ministries that are making a difference right here in Roswell, New Mexico. When you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll get notifications when we go live and when we post new content like sermon series, special events, translations of our service in Spanish, and even videos for Kids on the Move and 180. At Church on the Move, we strongly believe in the power of prayer. And throughout today's service, we have a team of people that'll stand in agreement with you and pray with you during our service online. If you'd rather have someone pray with you privately, you can visit cotmrosel.com slash prayer. One of our staff members will gladly stand in agreement with you. If you live in the Roswell, New Mexico area, we'd love to invite you to our in-person service that happens every Sunday at 9, 1045, 1230, and 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. We'll believe you'll feel right at home and that you'll experience true life change, whether you're in person or right here with us online. So let's get started. Well, Church on the Move, it's great to be with you tonight. It's so exciting to be in the house of God with you. Who's excited to be in church? All right. Hey, as we sing and as we worship our God, we just encourage you to sing with us. We have the words behind us. If you're online, we encourage you to sing with us as well. Come on, let's sing these words. Here we go.
ashamed to declare it now. Come on, sing this. Oh, I like you. I- 
been faithful Cause all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt
God. Church family, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you. Lord, it is so awesome to be able to come before you and lift up your name and praise you and worship you. Father, we're looking forward to an eternity of that. But Father, there's no one who deserves our praise and our gratitude, Father God, but you. You deserve it all because you're the giver of all good things. And Father, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, who you sent to take our place and to love us and care for us. Father, we pray tonight, Lord, for those who don't know, don't know your son, Jesus, as their savior, Father, that as they receive ministry from churches all around our city, state, and nation, Father, that tonight they receive you and know you for who you are, their Father, and they receive Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. Father, we pray tonight, Father, for all those pastors who are, who are doing what you've called them to do and leading us spiritually in this nation, Lord, we pray that you would bless them and their families. And we lift up our governmental leaders to you, Father God, at every level. Father, we pray for those who are doing what you've asked them to do. Father, who, are, who have the heart to serve people. And Father God, who are cooperating with you and your vision for our nation. Lord, we pray that you would expand their territory and their influence. Lord, for those who are in those offices and that are opposed to you, or those who are seeking those offices and opposed to you, Father, we pray that you remove them from any kind of influence, from any kind of leadership. Father God, that the evil that is in their hearts because of who the enemy is, Lord, Father, that it would be removed from leadership. And Lord, we pray tonight and thank you for all those who serve in our military, our law enforcement, our first responders. Father, we pray, Lord, that you protect them and their families wherever they are this evening. Father God, help them to walk in your wisdom, to be a blessing to others, Father. Repay them for their goodness. And Father God, that you've placed in their hearts towards others. And Lord, we're ready to receive your word tonight from our pastor and the other ministers on this campus. We thank you, Father God, that your word is all powerful. Lord, we thank you tonight that strongholds are torn down in lives. Father God, that your goodness is built up in people. And Lord, that we're blessed to sit under your word and that you change every single one of us for the better. We pray all this in the mighty name of your son, Jesus, and all the people of God said amen. Let's thank him one more time together, church family, because we serve a mighty God. He is so good. Praise your name. Well, it's great to be here with you tonight. Hey, before you're seated, if you're husband and wife, feel free to greet each other with a hug and a kiss. Otherwise, give five or six people around you a high five, a fist bump, a handshake, or a hug. Welcome to Church on the Move. Well, before Pastor Troy comes up to share the message with us, we want to take just a moment and welcome all of you who are joining us online. Thank you for coming to church tonight, uh, wherever you're at. Thank you so much for joining us for your first experience with Church on the Move Online. Please reach out to us with some information where we can connect with you. If you're in the room tonight and this is the first time that you've been here, you're a guest with us, we just want to say thank you for coming and spending your Wednesday with us. Welcome to Church on the Move. We would really like to get to meet you, and we want to have a gift delivered to your home for being our guest. Now, how we do that is our ushers have some cards in their hands. We would like to get that card to you, and ask that you just fill that out and drop it in the offering bucket when it comes by here in a few moments. Then when service is over, we have prepared a place for you out by our coffee shop. Please meet us out there. That's where we want to meet you and, and get to chat with you for just a little bit. So if that's you and you're here for the first time, would you do us a favor? Would you mind lifting your hand so we can welcome you and one of our ushers can hand you that card? It's good to see you all. We're so glad that you're here. Nice to have you with us. Just keep your hands up there. Ushers coming up behind you right now. Thank you for being patient. And if anyone needs a tithe and offering envelope or if you need a care card for a prayer request or a praise report, go ahead and lift your hand. One of our ushers will be glad to get that for you. And we do want our guests to know that we are not placing any expectation on you to give. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, so don't hide your light. Let it shine brightly before others so that the commendable things you do will shine as light upon them and they will give their praise to your Father in heaven. You know, church, family, as we tithe and give, it's inevitable that God is gonna bless us and we should never be embarrassed of the blessings that God pours out in our lives. Amen? We shouldn't be embarrassed of it because it's a blessing from God. And if, if it was something that he wanted it to be hidden, then he would have us hide it. But the word of God says, don't hide it. 
Don't hide the things that you do that are good for other people and don't hide the blessings of God because they're a testimony of his goodness in our lives. That's how people know that we're in favor with him and that we have a relationship with him is because they see his touch on our lives, amen? So let's let that shine and reach other people with his goodness. As yesters get ready to come up and receive the tithes and offerings, if you would please go ahead and direct your attention to the announcements. hosting their annual Vacation Bible Extreme, June 2nd through the 4th. This is a completely free event for kids kindergarten through third grade. The first 200 kids who sign up will receive a free gift, so make sure you register your child today. You can register them online or by downloading our church app. Our Adoptive Block ministry will be having their monthly outreach this Saturday, May 21st. If you're interested in serving, you can sign up at the Information Center after service. For more information on everything going on here at the church, you can check out our Facebook or Instagram. Now let's give God a praise as we welcome up our senior pastor, Troy Smith. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, guys. Good evening, church. Man, we have some great things happening tonight. One of the first things we're going to do is welcome all those that went through our Unite class. That, yeah, they're joining our ministry going to join in and be part of the ministries of our church. I want to read a couple scriptures before they come up. It says in Romans 12, 4, In the human body there are many parts and organs, each with a unique function. And so it is in the body of Christ. For though we are many, we've all been mingled into one body in Christ. This means that we are all vitally joined to one another with each contributing to the others. You know... I think about why we named, we renamed that class a long time ago, called it Unite, because God commands us to live in unity. And where the, where the Spirit of the Lord is, uh, or where there's unity, the Spirit of the Lord will operate. The Spirit of the Lord will operate when there's unity, whether it's in your home, or it's at work, or especially in the body of Christ, in the church. And so the, the Bible talks a lot about being unique, that we, we're all unique. Like all the parts of a different, of the body, uh, every part is unique. Every part's different. The thumb is different than the nose, and the eye is different than the ear, and the big toe looks considerably different than your elbow, right? I mean, they're just all unique, these unique pieces, but they fit together. And when they're all healthy and in unity, wow. Wow, the human body can function at a really high level. And that's why God compares it to the human body. Because he wants us to understand that when we all operate together, man, we can do some great things for the kingdom of God and for each other. He goes on to say in verse 16 of that same chapter, he said, live happily together. So he wants us to be happy. You know, you've heard that term happily ever after. He wants us to live happily together. And how do you live happy to, happily together? In a spirit of harmony. When there's a spirit of unity, man, you're going to be happier. You know, I, I think I see some beautiful things in my life. And I think two of the most beautiful things I've ever seen is when the body of Christ is all working together to do something. When we do sugar rush or we even just do church, you know, just, you know, people don't realize it takes like three, four hundred volunteers to do a Sunday service, to do the three Sunday services. It takes so many people. And when that functions right and flows, man, it's, it's amazing how the Spirit of God moves to change people's lives. Some of your lives, I know my life was changed in a church that they were unified. They had a purpose, and because there was unity there, the Spirit of the Lord was able to operate and save my life. Just like many of you have been saved because of that spirit of harmony, that spirit of unity. And he, when that happens in your home or at work or in the church, there's joy. 
There's a genuine joy there. And God wants us to have a genuine joy in the body of Christ. Okay. All right. Then he says this, and be as mindful of another's worth as you are of your own. You know, the only time I've seen, uh, uh, I was going to tell you the two most beautiful things is when I've seen the body of Christ functioning in unity and when I see my family doing it. Those, those two things are just beautiful to me. Two most beautiful things is when I see people working together in the church or in my home. Because it brings such joy. And there's so help. There's so much help. And there's many hands. And there's just everybody doing their part and pulling their weight. There's just something about that that is, that is absolutely beautiful. And he said, listen, uh, don't be mindful of your own worth. Uh, make sure that you value others as much as you value yourself. You know, the people I see come and go from the body of Christ, a lot of times they just get haughty. They think they're better than me or you or the church or the church leadership. And I mean, they just get haughty. They think their value or their worth is greater than everybody else's in the church. Listen, we're all on equal footing here. Uh, I might have a title and there might be other titles that God has given. Uh, but, you know, as far as our mindset needs to be is that everybody's valuable here. Someone say amen, right? Everybody has a value. So don't, don't think more highly of yourself than you should when you see someone working in the nursery. Don't think that you're better because you're a greeter or, or because you're this or that or another thing. We're all, we're all here to serve, amen? amen? I don't want anybody to cut off my thumb or my big toe <laughs> or my little baby toe. I don't want any part of my body. I don't want anybody poking my eye out. I think every part, I want to keep it all together. Right? And so, man, you value every part. And that's how God wants us to value the body. He wants us to, to, to value each other the way you value yourself. You think you're making a difference here? Then you should think everybody else is making the same difference. Come on now. That's, that's, how, well, God, that's how you keep harmony. And that's how you keep happy. He said this, don't live with a lofty mindset thinking you are too important to serve others. You know, man, I've, I've been, I, I, I just got to brag on you guys. I've been in a lot of churches in my lifetime. I've visited a lot of churches. I've never seen a church more willing to not only give, but also to give time and effort. I remember starting on the back here in the back on this floor, and a bunch of us got together, and we scrubbed this floor, I don't know, three or four times, uh, because they stained it before they built the building. And so we had to clean it a bunch of times to keep it clean. And we all were on our hands and knees, and all of us, me, my wife, my family, your families, many of you that were here, and we just took off on our hands and knees and scrubbed this floor. And we did it multiple times, keeping this floor clean. I remember mopping this when we built the children's building. We're all over there mopping and emptying buckets and doing stuff together. Doing stuff together. And I love it that not only uh, is our church family, are you givers financially, but you're servants. And that's a rare combination. And not only do I brag on you, I brag on you everywhere I go, but others that have come here and visited brag on you because they see that, the heart of the servant. That's the heart of Jesus, amen? And he wants us to think that way, that we're never too big to serve. I, I know that when, when we've added elders to our elder board, that one of the first things they'll say is, where do they serve? That's the first thing they'll say. Do they tithe and do they serve? And if they're not doing either one of those or both of those, they, they're not eligible to come on our, board, our, our, our elder board. Do they tithe and do they serve? And where do they serve? Why? Because if you think you're too big to serve in a ministry here, then, then we think you're too big to be on the elder board. You got to be a servant to be in leadership. And so he says that to us. He says, uh, but be willing to do menial tasks. He said, be willing to be, don't think you're too important to serve others. He said, but be willing to do menial tasks and identify with those who are humble minded. Don't be smug or even think for a moment that you know it all. Never hold a grudge or try to get even, but plan your life around the noblest way to benefit others. Otherwise, plan your life about, you know, um, Pastor Barnett said, you know, look to be a blessing. Plan your life about, hey, how am I going to be a blessing to them? How am I going to be a blessing there? That's how he wants us. God 
Tells us in the Word, plan your life around that. Then he said this, do your best to live as everybody's friend. When we do that in the body of Christ, wow. We have not seen all that God wants to do and is going to do in our church. Our best days of church on the move are in front of us, not behind us. When I first got here, yeah. When I, when I first got here, I, I, I made so many changes that people would come to me and say, I liked it the way it was before. I'm, I, I said, man, we're not going back there. And many of them didn't, didn't stay. Many of them had to move because they wanted to stay back in 19-whatever, 98. They didn't want to change. They didn't want to grow. Listen, you got to be willing to grow. You got to be willing to change. You got to be willing to welcome in new people and say, man, I'm glad they're here and I'm glad they're serving too. We, all, we have to have that spirit of friendship and unity in the body of Christ. That's a pretty smooth move right there, man. I forget that thing's there most of the time. And so with that heart, I want to welcome all our new uh, all the people that were able to come tonight weren't working, and all the ones that, that went to Unite class that are joining the ministries, the ministry of Church on the Move and becoming part of our family. And so, Pastor Sean, you want to come on out, and, and uh, he's going to read off your name. I'm going to ask you to come on up. I, I just want to shake your hand and welcome you. We're all going to celebrate you, and then we'll put you right back in your seat. So go ahead. Don Adams, would you go ahead and come up here and come join on, us? Come on, Don. Let's give Don a hand. Graydon Adams. All the way from the back. Don and Graydon. Carmen Cars. Alicia Avitia. Danny Carrera. Phyllis Chambers. Anthony Chavez. Desiree Duran, Carlos Gomez, I bet you, I bet you. Autumn Lant, James Leonard, wow. June Muniz, Delia Salcido, Louis Salcido, Bianca Segura, and Aubrey White. As they come up here, Church on the Move family, would you stand up? Let's celebrate them. Let's greet them. The more people that join, the more people we touch, the more lives are impacted, and that's how the kingdom of God is built. So let's thank Make them class, as huh? they serve with us <laughs> and awesome. serve hey. us. Thank and you sometimes will thank serve you. for us. Hey, God Praise you God for all of these I people. Saw. And thank you to all of you who are part of our Unite uh, who are all part of our dream team and have gone through the Unite class. Church on the Move would not exist without all of you, as Pastor has so eloquently put tonight. So God bless you. You can be seated, and uh, Pastor will be right up here to, to preach the message with us. To all of you, welcome to the team. We are so glad to have you. Wow, wow, wow. What a great looking group of people uh, coming to join our ministries and Man, oh man, oh man. Uh, you know, uh, Pastor Barnett comes from L.A., and where there's, you know, there's a mixture of people there. But he made a comment uh, uh, about that he's never seen such a, a group of people that are, uh, and his church is, is very uh, uh, ergonomic, man. It's everybody's there, and I've been to that church service before in L.A. But he said he's never seen a mixture economically and racially like our church. And uh, he said that there's diamonds in the rough all around the world. And he said, this is one of the best diamonds in undiscovered churches in the United States. And so, uh, man, he, he had a lot of praise for our church. Um, and so that's, that's a testimony to all of us just carrying the heart of Jesus. Hey, Amen. there's no Jew or Greek here. Uh, you know what? We celebrate men and we celebrate women uh, and we celebrate each other. Amen. And most of all, we celebrate Jesus. That's what we want to do is we want to celebrate Jesus. And so thank all of you for going through Unite class and 
joining the, the ministry of Church on the Move and being part of other, the, all the ministries that we have here. You know, one of the ones that was talked about on the screen was Adopt-A-Block. That comes from Pastor Tommy Barnett and from the Dream Center. Uh, Pastor Tommy came up with that in Phoenix and then extended that to the Dream Center in L.A. And Matthew, his son, who was here ministering Sunday, he extended that and built on that. And I've been part, I've served in that ministry, Adopt-A-Block, in Los Angeles. It's an amazing ministry, and we, we started it here, and Pastor Sergio's over that. And so, man, if you want to be part of that, we, our goal is to have uh, three or four people to have a captain on every block in Roswell, that has three or four people that work with them that goes at least once a month, knocks on every door and says, is there anything we can do for you? We can't do everything, but what we can do, we, we will do. And if anything, we want to pray with you on every block in Roswell. That's what adopt a block is all about. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if we had a group of three or four people that knocked on every door of every block all around the city, said, can we pray for you? Can we help you? Can we be a blessing to you? And man, that would be amazing. So man, if you want to be part of that, join that team. We're, we, need, we need followers and we need leaders in that group. People that will take on a block and say, this is my block. And take ownership of that from a ministry standpoint and say, as a representative of the kingdom of God and church on the move, man, we're going to be here once a month to minister to you and your family. And so, man, be part of that. That would be awesome to be part of. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. You know, I'm going to read some, some scriptures to you uh, as we get into, uh, you know, talking more about idols. But I, I, I want to talk tonight about probably the greatest idol that God recognized in the Bible, um, he, he, uh, he pointed out this idol as the greatest threat to Christianity and the one that would be that have the hardest tug on the hearts of people, and that's the idol of money. God specifically states that in the Word. But before we get to that, I just want to read some scriptures. I know they're, they're common to many of us, maybe not to some of you, but you need, I just believe you needed to hear this tonight. In Romans 8, 31, it says, So what does all this mean? If God is determined to stand with us, tell me, who then could ever stand against us? Paul's writing this to the Roman Christians. He's not been to Rome to minister to them, but he's writing to them, and they're under great persecution. And he's saying, listen, even though you're under all the, for this persecution and all these things are happening to you, that's not, nothing's compared to the glory of God. Man, what's coming and what's going to happen and what God's going to do, nothing's going to be compared to that. So he's like, if God be for you, man, who can stand against you? What? Don't, don't worry about the stuff that's happening down here so much. Keep your eyes focused on the things of God because he loves you and he's for you. He wants good things to happen to you. So often, man, we pit ourselves against God because something doesn't go our way and we, we blame it on God. And we're like, well, God, why aren't you doing this? And God, why aren't you doing that? Man, we need to hang on with a loyal love. Let me say that again. A loyal love that says, God, I believe you're always for me. Even when you're correcting me, I believe you're for me. You know, when I've corrected my children in times past, there's a scripture that says the rod of correction drives foolishness out of the heart of the child. And we would, I would spank them and I'd, after I spanked them and comforted them because uh, I always wanted to comfort them, comfort them because God comforts us even when we blow it. God comforts us even when we blow it, even when we come in tears, say, God, I blew it. I made a terrible decision. It hadn't worked out. I'm hurting. And he, yeah, he'll correct us, but then he comforts us and dries our tears. And so that's what I would do. That's what I would do with the kids. They would, they would do that right there. They'd scream just like that. Because I spanked them and then Man, I try to love on them and talk to them about that. I also tell, would tell them, listen, the Bible says that if I don't discipline you, I hate you. That if I love you, I will discipline you. Now, we have a culture in this world, that idol of culture we talked about for several Wednesday nights, man, that, that says that discipline's ugly and correction is wrong. But that's not what our Father says. Our Father says, I correct the ones I love. So even when he corrects us, he still wants us to know that I'm correcting you because I'm for you. 
I want you, I want things to be better for you. I want to drive foolishness far from your heart so you don't do foolish things over and over and over again and get the results of that. Why? Because he loves us. He cares for us. So even when you're being corrected, man, welcome God's correction. King David, man, he blew it a lot, but he would welcome God's. He's like, I welcome your correction. And he would identify the things that he had done wrong. He would identify him. He'd say, yeah, I know I did this, and I know I did that. And God, I confess. I confess that to you, Lord. And with confession comes forgiveness. And he would, in reconciliation, because he wanted to keep his relationship with God right. But he knew always, no matter what happened in his life, no matter if he sinned or didn't, no matter what happened, he knew to run to God because he believed thoroughly that God was good. And that he was for him, yes. And that he was for him. You know, hope, guys, hope is an unwavering belief that God is good. Let me say that again. Hope is an unwavering belief, unwavering that God is good and that he wants to be good to me, to you. It's an unwavering hope. And we need to hang on to that and believe what he says and understand that nothing's going to compare to heaven. Nothing's going to compare to heaven. And that he's, but he's speaking that to us in this life. I'm for you, not against you. Don't treat me like I'm against you. Treat me like I'm for you. Open your heart and listen. Confess your sins and let me forgive you. I want to, he wants to forgive us. He wants to help us get things right and restore us. I, I, I love the way God loves us. In 38 and 39, he goes on to say, so now I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. Paul said, I live with a confidence. He said, I want you to live with a confidence that nothing will separate you from the love of God. Nothing. And he said this, I'm convinced that his love will triumph over death, life's troubles, fallen angels, or dark rulers in the heavens. There is nothing in our present or future circumstances that can weaken his love. There is no power above us or beneath us, no power that could ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. He wants to lavish his love, and he has lavished his love on us by sending his son to die for our sins and conquering sin and death for us. Why is it so important that we understand that when we're talking about the idol of money? Because, man, uh, where your, the Bible says where your heart is is where you're going to go, and we'll, we'll read that scripture when it comes to money. Money's the number one thing, the number one topic. I've said it many times because I want you to get used to hearing it. It's the number one topic that people do not want talked about in church ever. Amen. You can talk about it at Walmart. You could talk about it at the bank. You could talk about it at the bank that's charging you interest on money, that's using your money to make money. You could talk to them all day about money, and they're making money off of you. Amen. Talk to them any day. Talk, to, talk about money at the car dealership. Talk about money at the furniture store. Talk about money anywhere. At, at 7-Eleven, you can talk about money. It's about money, right? If you try to walk out without paying, you'll find out real quick that it's about money. Right? And so, but the, the one place that no one wants to talk about it is in the church. Why is that? Because Satan's done an incredible job of convincing people that it's only your money when it comes to the church. Everywhere else, it's okay to talk about. You can talk about money at the school. You can talk to the money about money to the IRS. They'll talk to you about money. You can talk about money anywhere and everywhere. You can talk about money at your job. Just don't talk about it in the church. Why? Because the only threat that your money has is in the hands of God. It's in the hands of the body of Christ. That's the th real threat to his kingdom. So he's done a great job about, of lying about money in the body of Christ. A tremendous job of lying about it. 
in getting people to, to treat it like it's, a, it's, a, it's evil in the church. Wow. What a great job Satan has done. You know how good a job he's done? Only 3 to 5% of all people in America tithe. That means only 3 to 5% of all people that call themselves Christians actually support the church. Yeah, it got quiet here. Always gets quiet when we talk about the idol of money. Because when it comes to everything else, man, you want God involved except in your money. That's how most people, not you, but that's how most people are. Maybe some of you. And God has a lot to say about that. That's why, because it's the number one topic. You know the number one thing that people are going to vote about? This, they said their number one topic is the economy, is money. I'll say this, if they put some other things in front of that, money won't be an issue. If they'll put, if they'll put voting based on the things of God and on character and on what is right, and on saving babies, and on doing things that are right, and treating people right, take care of the elderly and our children, and doing things right. If we'll put those things in front of the economy, we would never have to worry about the economy. The economy will take care of itself. And if you, if you believe in God, and you're, you're sold out to the kingdom of God, and you don't you don't think you're um, giving your tithe or your money to the church. You're actually bringing it to God, not giving it to him. You're bringing back what is his. If you live like that, you'll never have to worry about the economy either. As long as you're not doing that, thinking that somehow this is some kind of get-rich-quick scheme that God has put together. No, it's a manner of heart and honor. I, I bring my tithe to this church and have tithe since I was 19 years old. I brought the tithe. I wasn't giving God anything. I was bringing to God what belongs to him. And through the tithe is how God taught me how to not be greedy and envious and jealous and not, not to be a taker but to be a giver. That's how he's designed it. And he's blessed me because I've supported his work Financially, he's blessed my family over and over and over again. He's taking care of us. He's taking good care of us. We've always had food on the table. We've always had a roof over our head. He's, he's been good to us. My children have had shoes on their feet and clothes on their back. Well, Pastor, that's pretty simple. Yeah, you know, sometimes it's that simple. Sometimes you got to be blessed with the simple. And if you're not blessed and grateful for that, God will never give you anything else till you get grateful for what you do have and what he has done and how good he's already been. I like this word that Paul uses in the Passion Version. I live with confidence. I'm confident of his love. I like it. We need to be confident that he loves us. It's that confidence in his love that has kept me going for these 40 uh, some plus years uh, of serving him. It's just a confidence that he loves me and that he's for me and not against me. If I didn't have that, there's a thousand times I would have quit. But because I have this confidence that he's for me and he loves me, when it looks the darkest, he comes through the best. When I'm, when I'm at my worst, he still gives me his best. He's a forgiving God and a loving God and he's a giving God. He's a giver. God's generous. I mean, he's generous. He's incredible how generous he is. And he wants a people that are, that are generous. And he wants to bless people that are generous. And that their, their idol is not money, but their idol and their only object of worship is God Almighty. And that money's not even a... Not a, not, any, not a fight inside of you. That's why he established giving and tithing. Because he, wanted, he didn't want that fight to continually take place in your life. He wanted to teach you how to overcome a saying, being five years old. What do I mean by that? When you're three, four, and five, your favorite word is mine. He wants you to grow up past that. He wants us all to grow up past that and say, no, God, everything in my life is yours. Every good gift I have, every paycheck I get is yours. 
If you only ask me to bring you 10%, then that's awesome. But if you want it all, I'll give you all of it. See, he's looking for a heart that will honor him. He's looking, he wants to bless you when you become a blessing. A lot of times we say, well, God, if, you, if I win the lottery, I'll do this, this, and this. No, he's not playing that game. He's not going to do that. I was going to go into Joel, but I'll, I'll get to that next week. Oh, there's, there's seven, uh, seven unbelievable blessings that come through the atonement that God talks about in, through the prophet Joel that we'll get to next time. But right now, I, I, I want to look at some other scriptures about how God wants to bless and how God thinks about the heart of a person. Go with me to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. In verse 2 and 3, it says this. You jealously want what others have, so you begin to see yourself as better than others. You scheme with envy and harm, harm others to selfishly obtain what you crave. You want to harm people to get what you want. That's why you quarrel and fight. And all the time you don't obtain what you want because you won't ask God for it. And if you ask, you won't receive it, for you're asking with corrupt motives, seeking only to fulfill your own selfish desires. It amazes me how many times people ask God to heal them, and that even when he does heal some of them, they go right back to living the way they were. I mean, they get healed, and then they go right on and use their health to go out and do whatever they still want to do. There's no change. Or I believe a lot of people don't get healed because they don't have a heart to change. And that's not every circumstance, but that's a lot of circumstances. What are you going to use that health for? For yourself or for a God? And so a lot of people ask God, make me rich, God. Give me this, God. Give me that, God. And their motive is that as soon as they get it, they're going to run off with it and go do whatever they want. That's what he's saying. You have wrong motives when you ask me. God wants to say yes. We know that. He said it. He said, all of my promises are yes, except for two reasons. One, you don't ask, and two, you ask with the wrong motive. He said, that's the only time my, my promises are no. It's no if you don't ask, and no, no if you ask for a wrong motive, that you're going to take what you get from me and go do what you want to do with it instead of what I ask you to do with it. So God's, God's a God of the heart. Man, he doesn't want, he said, we're called to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. He wants us here, not here. He wants us in the front, not in the back. But the, there's a lot of reasons why a lot of Christians aren't experiencing the promises of God because their heart isn't right towards God. You can't want what he has without wanting him first to get it. Everybody wants what he has. I hear the word blessing thrown around by everybody you can think of. I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. And then I, I find out about their life later. They're not blessed. They don't even know the God of blessing. They just throw that word around, trying to act like everything's so great in their life until their life gets exposed. God wants to bless. I mean, it's his heart to bless. He prefers blessing over anything. He prefers mercy over justice. That's it. He's got a preference. His preference is to bless, not curse. His, bless, his preference is to have mercy, not to pass judgment. That, that's his preference on everything. We need to have a preference. Our preference needs to be God over everything. It needs to be God over everything. God, I take you over everything. You tell me to do this, I'll do it. You tell me to do that, I'll do it. You say to do this, I'll do it. And I prefer you over everything. How do I know I prefer God over everything? Do you delight in his word? He says in Proverbs, if you delight in my word, I'll give you the desires of your heart. If you'll commit your ways to me, I'll bring those desires to pass. So he said, listen, if you delight in me first, I'll give you the desires of your heart. And if you commit your way to me 
first, then I'll bring those desires to pass. It all comes down to the heart. So many people want the blessings of God. They want to be financially blessed, and they say, well, when that happens, I'll bless, and I'll give, and I'll do this, and I'll do that. But guys, it comes down to where your heart is at with God. Let me give you some characteristics of greed. Characteristics of greed. Just, just judge your own heart in this. Don't judge the person next to you. Just judge your own heart in this. Okay? God said judge yourself first, right? Judge yourself first. One, do you ignore people when you see them in need and you can meet their needs? Do you ignore them? when you know you can do something for them. And I'm not talking about these people that are con artists on the street. Man, everywhere I go now, we are in Phoenix, Albuquerque, everywhere I go, there's more and more people that are fully capable of working that are just playing games out there. It's like a way of living now. I guess that's, my wife said, that's their job. That's their new job. Well, I'm not gonna, I'm only gonna help in those situations if the Spirit of God tells me to. I'm not just naturally going to, I'm not going to throw my money away. Because God said, if you're lazy, you shouldn't expect to eat. And I see a lot of laziness and a lot of people don't want to work. They don't want to make any commitment. They don't want any responsibility. They just want to do their thing. Well, I'm not going to bless that. Unless God specifically tells me to, I'm not automatically blessing that. But do you see needs of others and you can meet them and you ignore them? Number two, you never, ever have enough money. You're never satisfied at any level. Never. I, I know one way God taught me about greed. He said, I, I was talking to somebody, uh, I was selling something to somebody, and I sold it, and I thought later, dead coming, I should have asked for more. And God spoke to me right there, he said, that's greed. He said, did you get what you asked for? And I said, yes. He said, then you walked away thinking, oh, man, that guy got a good deal over me, and I should ask for more. I could have got a little bit more for that. I should ask just 10 bucks more. He said, that's greed. He said, stop that. You got what you asked for? Be content. If they go out and sell it and make $100,000 next week, you be happy that you got what you wanted out of it. That's greed. When you always think you're paying too much or always think you're selling it for too little and always thinking I could have got more, 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 and more, that's greed. Set your price, sell it, move on if you get it. Praise God for it. You, you constantly, number three, you constantly work, 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 and the rest of your life is a wreck. I know so many people that live like this right here. They work, 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 make money, 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 and their families are falling apart. Their health is falling apart. I had a boss fall, fall. He hit the ground so hard dead that that thump on the ground to, this, to, the, to the day, years later, when any kind of noise sounded like that, the whole office would jump because he felt dead at work. I mean, he was dead before he hit the ground of a heart attack. And his family was a wreck. He had a lot of money. Guess what? When he died, he didn't take it with him. He came in empty-handed, and he left empty-handed. But he left a mess behind him. Why? Because he never was enough. Work, 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 work. Money, 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 money. Paycheck, 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 paycheck. Titles, 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 titles. And the rest of his life he didn't care about. If the rest of your life is, is a wreck and you're working night and day nonstop, you're in greed. Stop it. It will, it will cost you your life. You'll leave a mess behind too. Number four, one of the other characteristics of greed is you have no self-control over buying stuff and finances. No self-control. Or, so you have no stewardship. You don't steward your money well. You buy and sell and do everything emotionally. You don't do anything out of wisdom. That's a characteristic of greed. Another characteristic of greed is you never spend any money. Too loose, too tight. God wants you to be able to say yes and no based on good, wise stewardship, not just out of some emotion or feeling. You know why car salesmen have you take the car home? They want, they're like, take it. Drive it home. 
Why? Because they want you to get in that new car, driving around like, I can't live without this bad boy. Man, it smells better than my old car, drives better, cleaner. I mean, they want you to take it home. They want you to, to do it. That's why they'll say, hey, man, we'll, if you don't, you can bring it back in 60 days. You know how many people ever send anything back? Hardly ever. You can send it back. They know that's not going to happen. Some people are too lazy to send it back even if they don't like it. And most people, once they get it, it's newer than what they have. They're going to keep it. Why? Because Satan is counting on you buying and selling emotionally and through your flesh and not through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit and his word when it comes to finances. I know others that are so tight they won't spend a dime on anything. Their answer is no to everything except what they want. Their answer is no to their wife, no to their husband, no to their kids. It's no, 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 unless I want something. That's another form of greed. No, I'm not going to give. No, I'm not going to support. No, I'm not going to help. It's no, 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 no. God wants us to use his wisdom and his stewardship that he talks about in his word in the leading of the Holy Spirit to know when to say yes and when to say no. Because it's not always yes and it's not always no. We need to know when it is yes and when it is no. When we're supposed to help and when we're not supposed to. When we should spend the money and when we shouldn't. I don't know how many times Julie and I have talked and said, yeah, man, we'll, we'll get this. We have the finances. We can pay cash for that. We'll go get this. And then, man, I'll just, well, I'll have a check, and I'll come back and say, babe, I just got this check. And she go, I know, I do too. We're not supposed to do that. We're not supposed to do that. Matter of fact, that happened to us in January where we were going to do something, and we both had a check. And then, man, I, I said, okay, God, you're not going to let us spend it. Can we give it? And he said, Absolutely. So we gave an extra check to the church, a pretty big check to the church instead of spending that money on what we wanted. He wanted us to sow, not, not harvest at that time. He's like, this is a time to sow, not to harvest. And when you listen to that, that means God trying to set you up for a greater harvest. But you gotta listen. You gotta listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit and you gotta operate with the wisdom of God when it comes to stewardship. It's not always yes, it's not always no. Let me say this too, when it comes to greed. Envy and greed are friends. Envy, greed says, I never have enough for me. Envy says, I not only want what I want, but I want what you have. I want what you have. I wanna, I wanna not only wanna get mine, I wanna take yours from you. I don't want you to have anything better than me. That's envy. Envy and greed work together. They work, they're best friends. Those spirits, those demonic spirits are best friends. And they all serve, envy and greed serve one God. His name is Mammon. The Bible talks about the God of money, Mammon. And that's Satan himself. He wants to control the finances. If every person that called themselves a Christian would actually just tithe, not even give an offering, but just tithe, the church would have an extra $139 billion a year. 139 billion. You know what we could do with that? We could eliminate poverty. There wouldn't be a child going hungry. There wouldn't be a place that we couldn't provide jobs and help people. There would not be, there, there'd always be a rehab center. There would always be a homeless shelter. There'd always be a soup kitchen. There, there wouldn't be a need we could not meet. But Satan has done such a good job, he's got at least 95% of all Christians not even bringing the tithe, let alone even thinking about being generous. No church would ever have to take a loan to build a building. We'd never have to go to the bank and ask permission. I have to go to the bank to ask permission. I hate it, to be honest with you. I hate going to bankers, to the world, and asking permission to build the kingdom of God. I hate it with a passion. But you do what you got to do to keep expanding the kingdom. When people don't do what they're supposed to do. People who are greedy, they lack empathy. They never look and say, man, if I could do something, I would. Or I can do something, I will. People that are greedy are never satisfied. Here's one I really like. Not like, but I think is, is really good. People that are greedy and love money more than God, they manipulate other people. 
They'll, they'll do what we call brown nosing. They'll, they'll, do, they'll say anything, do anything, and then they'll talk behind someone's back, but they'll manipulate anybody they think is rich, anybody that they think can give them something. I, I've known ministers like that. I've known, I've known co-workers that were like that. I mean, they, they'd say, oh, boss, you're great. They want something from the boss. And then behind their back, they're like, ah, they're terrible, they're horrible. I, but they'll, they'll manipulate, they'll lie, they'll, they'll deceive they won't compliment people. They'll flatter them. Flattery is a form of, that's telling you something that's not true about yourself, but trying to make you feel good and like them more so you'll give them something. I see people that get around rich people. My gosh, it's unreal how manipulative they come, and they want to get in their graces, and they want to be around people with money all the time. That's greed. Hoping that, that they'll write them a check or do something for them. And they operate in the ministries of hints all the time. Family members and others, I've seen them, they operate in the ministry of hints. Ah, oh, you know, I wish I had new tires. I'm praying about having new tires. I see you got new tires. They're always operating the ministry of hints of what they don't have and what they need instead of praying to God. Instead of sowing into God's kingdom, instead of doing things right, that's what greedy people do. That's what people who worship money do. We're not called to be worshipers of money. God said, quit worrying about all these, these things you need in this life. Stop serving money. Matthew 6, go with me. Matthew 6. Church, man, people who worship and serve money, they, they're always worried about everything. Ultimately, our faith just has to be in God to supply. He says in Matthew 6, verse 19, don't keep hoarding for yourself earthly treasures that can be stolen by thieves. Material wealth eventually rusts, decays, and loses its value. Instead, stockpile heavenly treasures for yourselves that cannot be stolen and will not, never rust, decay, or lose their value. What is a heavenly treasure? It's people. People going to heaven. He says, stockpile heavenly treasures. Mm -mm -mm. I like the thought of that. Stockpile heavenly treasures. For your heart will always pursue. This is the scripture. Listen to this. For your heart will always, always, everybody say always, always. pursue what you value as your treasure. Your heart will always pursue what you value as your treasure. The eyes of your spirit allow revelation light to enter into your being. If your heart is unclouded, the light floods in. But if your eyes are focused on money, everybody say money. But if your eyes are focused on money, the light cannot penetrate and darkness takes its place. I don't know how many times we've been blasted for teaching on tithing and giving at our church. We've been called all kinds of names over it. We've been accused of looking at people's tax returns and making sure they're tied. We've been accused of everything. Matt, one guy over this situation, over the election, uh, uh, by the way, get out and vote for Lieutenant uh, James Mason. Get out and vote for him. Get out and vote for Sheriff Harrington. Vote, 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 vote for these Christian men. But, uh, uh, you know, one guy said, uh, I think it's wrong what old Pastor Troy said. I'll just stay at my poor church. You know, that guy's a rich guy. It reminded me of what Judas said when that year's worth of perfume was given to Jesus, to the body of Christ. He said, oh, she should have given it to me, would have sold it and given it to the poor. Same attitude. Can I tell you that people like that will never come to our church? You know why? Because they'll never tithe. They don't want to be generous. They think it's all theirs. And they don't want to hear from the word. They want to hear, they want to get permission from their pastor and their church to never have to tithe, to never have to be generous, to never have to give unless they want to do it. And they want to look good. And they want someone to see it. It's all about them. That's that same statement. Oh, I'll stay at my poor church. Stay at your poor church that does nothing. Because you give nothing. You do nothing. 
You have nothing to give. You don't want anything happen to anybody else. So stay at your poor church. We're not the poor church. We're the generous church. Just in the last 20 years, we've given away $4.2 million. That's what we've done. You hear it all the time. Man, I love what Church on the Move does. I love what Church on the Move does. Some of those same critics are the ones that don't give anything. They'll compliment, but they won't come to church here. Why don't they just come to church here if we do so much? And I've had them say, you guys do so much, my church doesn't do anything. I'm like, well, either start, start giving to your church and turn that around or just get out of there and come here. I don't say that, but that's what I want to say. I say thank you and I move on. And I think that's the silliest reasoning I've ever heard. I'm always, I've always been and I always will be part of a generous church. We'll be generous. I said we'll be generous because our God is generous. We gave away more during COVID when everybody was tightening their belt than we had any of the previous years. That's what God does. But if your eyes are focused on money, the light cannot penetrate and darkness takes its place. How profound will be the darkness within you if the light of truth cannot enter? If you focus on money and money's your deal and money's your God, he said the light cannot enter. How could you worship two gods at the same time? You will have to hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't worship the true God while enslaved to the God of money. I've told people to say, Pastor, I can never be home. I can never be with my family. My, my marriage isn't good. My kids aren't doing well because I'm never home. I never get to go to church. I never get to do this. I'm thinking, man, dude, find another job. What's that worth? What's it worth to gain the whole world and lose your soul? Get in that praying and say, God, open another door. I'm going to walk right through it. Matter of fact, I'm going to go looking, God, for another job so I can have my marriage and I can be home with my kids and I can do something with my family and I can be in church and serve. Wow, find another job. God's better than that. Only money would drive you like that. Only the sorry demon called mammon would drive your life and ruin you. Ruin your life over money. Don't let it happen. God said this, this is why I tell you to never be worried about your life for all that you need will be provided such as food, water, clothing, everything your body needs. Isn't there more to life than a meal? Isn't your body more than clothing? Look at all the birds. Do you think they worry about their existence? They don't plant or reap or store up food, yet your heavenly father provides them each with food. Aren't you much more valuable to your father than they? So which of you by worrying could add anything to your life? And why would you worry about your clothing. Look at the beautiful flowers of the field. They don't work or toil, and yet not even Solomon and all his splendor were robed in beauty more than one of these. So if God has clothed the meadow with hay, which is here for such a short time and then dried up and burnt, won't he provide for you the clothes you need, even though you live with such little faith? So then forsake your worries. Why would you say, What will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For that is what the unbelievers chase after. Doesn't your heavenly father already know the things your bodies require? So above all, constantly chase after the realm of God's kingdom and the righteousness that proceeds from him. Otherwise, put his kingdom first. Then all these less important things will be given to you abundantly. I don't know how many people have learned at our church had a tithe, and it's changed. You hear some of the testimonies Pastor Sean shares with you. They've just learned to be givers and to tithe and to honor the Lord and how they are just constantly blessed. One of them, uh, a family in our church, man, he, he had one of those oil-filled jobs. Made 120000 a year. And his life was a wreck. His family was a wreck. His marriage was a wreck. He had all that money, and guess what? He was broke. He was broke. He thought he'd made it with that check. He was broke. 
He got out of that, got saved, got a job that didn't pay near as much, still doesn't. Been working at it almost 10 years. He is debt free, owns his house, debt free, happy, has a great marriage. His kids are awesome Christian kids. I mean, it changed his, meeting Jesus and learning how to trust God financially and being a tither has changed his world in every aspect, in every aspect. That's somebody that's sitting right here, born and raised in Roswell, sitting in this church with us. If it could happen for them, it could happen for you. But you know what he decided? He said, God, you're first. Not money, not this other stuff, not drinking, not all the drugs he was doing, not all the junk. He said, God, you're first. And man, God has just, over time, just continually blessed his life, his wife, his children, God said, those who favor my righteous cause. Otherwise, you, you, your heart favors God's cause of reaching people. He said, I will make them rich. That word rich means you'll have more than enough and you'll have money to give away. It doesn't mean what we think rich means. That it's just like you'll be a billionaire. He said, you'll, you'll be blessed in all that you put your hand to. You'll have more than enough to meet all your needs and more. You'll be able to give and live and, and I'll bless you, but your body will be healthy. Your, your relationships will be healthy. It means whole. It means complete. It means rich in this life and ready for the next one because God is first. God is first. Don't let money be your God. Gosh, money's terrible, God. Destroy your whole life. Destroy every relationship. Put God first. Amen? Oh, wow. Um, every eye closed here online. Listen, I, I started off with just how much God loves us. and You know, I, I was praying today. I said, and he's told me this many times, and I don't know if it just... People just need to hear this more. But every time I, I prayed, I said, God, what do you want me to say to them? I mean, this is what he said to me today. He said, tell them I love them. So I want to just say this. Uh, I believe I heard from my father. Uh, he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And if you'll learn to love him, and have a loyal love to him in the darkest and the brightest days of your life. He'll teach you. He'll grow you. He'll change you. He'll help you. And most importantly, most importantly, you'll spend a lifetime here being a blessing. You'll leave a blessing, not a curse on your family, on your friends, on people that know and care about you, on your friendships. You don't want to leave a curse. You want to leave a blessing. I've seen people leave a curse. Man, they die without anything to give. Can't even pay for their own funeral. They've planned for nothing, thought about nothing. Thought about no one but themselves, lived for themselves. Wow, it's, it's a sad way they leave. God didn't want you to leave like that. He didn't want you to live like that or leave like that. And most importantly, he wants you to spend a lifetime in heaven, an eternal lifetime, which is forever. He's like, man, if you've seen goodness on this planet, you see the beauty of this place, of the stars and the mountains, the prairies, the valleys, the oceans, whatever. You see the beauty of the sunrise and sunset. It's nothing compared to the beauty of heaven. This is forever. This is a forever thing. But your heart has to want a relationship with him. You have to want to know him. You know, no one wants to be used. God, God doesn't want to be used. He won't be used. So you have to want to know God. and You have to want to submit your life to him and say, God, I recognize you're God, I'm not. And whether for the first time that you're watching online or you're here in this auditorium in a sanctuary, or maybe it's the next time that you've just been far away. Maybe you ran away for whatever the reason. 
and you just need to come home, I, I want to tell you something. God welcomes you home with open arms. Man, he's not a God that gives you the cold shoulder, the silent treatment. No, man, he'll welcome you in his kingdom and welcome you home with open arms. He'll receive you just like you are. But if you'll stick around and you'll really serve him and build a relationship with him, he'll, he won't leave you the way you are. He will not leave you the way you are. He'll, he'll change you and grow you and help you. He'll help you become the best version of yourself you possibly can be. He'll teach you how to, how to be a blessing and walk in his blessings and live a life of blessing others and receiving his goodness. I mean, ah, oh, and in the deepest, darkest times that we all face and the troubles, man, he'll be right there with you. He'll lead you out and over and around those moments. He'll never leave you or forsake you. Nothing will be able to separate you from his love. So if you've never prayed and you want to pray here online, man, let's pray right now. Or maybe you've known him before and you've ran away and you, just, you need to pray and just come home. And so whether it's your first time or your next time, Let's pray right now. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do online. I'm going to ask you just to send us a message and say, I'm praying for the first time. I'm praying for the next time. Here in this room, on the count of three, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand up and say, it's me. I need to pray. And then after you send that online, after we, you raise your hand in here, right where you're seated or right where you're at online, we're going to pray. And if you're watching this on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, two weeks from now, listen, that prayer still counts. Don't let the enemy talk you out of it because it's not live. It's live to you and God's speaking to you even if it's weeks later. Just like he speaks through the Bible. It was written thousands of years ago, still speaking to us. This, this message will still speak to you no matter what time it is. Pray, pray, get right with God. And so send that message now if you're online in this room on the count of three, just raise your hand up high and then put it down and say, I'm gonna get right with God before I leave here. I'm gonna lay down all my idols. And I'm gonna get this right with God. I'm gonna serve him the rest of my life. Here we go, one, two, three. Raise your hand up high and say, it's me. Thank you all over this room. Thank you, thank you. God, at least so many. Thank you, thank you all over the room. Wow. Let's pray now. Those online and those here, let's all pray together. Say this together church say God I believe you are God and God alone I lay down all my idols I lay them all down everything that my heart has pursued above you I lay that down and tonight right now I put you first. Now I'm going to need your help living that way, changing my thinking, my attitudes. And I ask for your help right now to live that way from this night onward. Because I believe and I'm convinced that you love me. And because you do, you sent Jesus. And he died for my sins that kept us apart. And you raised him from the dead. And he's alive. And you conquered sin and eternal death to save my life. I'm convinced that you love me that much. And because I believe that, I ask that you forgive me of all my sins. And I receive your forgiveness, your mercy. And I say to you, Jesus, as your life was not your own, and you gave it to save me, I give my life to you so others can come to know you. You are the Lord Jesus Christ of my life from this day forward. Teach me how to live for you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit 
that lives in me now. And for all the adventures and blessings that I'll walk in from this day onward. In Jesus' name, so be it. Amen. Come on, let's thank God for how good he is. If you prayed with Pastor Troy tonight, as you leave, there's going to be someone at every door. Please let them know that you prayed. We have some things that we'd like to give you. They're going to help you in your, in your walk with Christ. We'll also give you a Bible if you don't have a Bible. Would you stand up with me? Church on the move, you are blessed and highly favored of God. Have an awesome rest of your week. We will see you on Sunday. God bless you. You're dismissed.